Welcome back to another math video here at Math Rocks with Mr. Cox. This video is to look, taking a look at all the different quadrilateral shapes like a square or a rectangle, trapezoid, rhombus, kite, parallelogram, and others. But moving past their actual definitions and into what we call their properties, which are other things that are true about these shapes not included in the definition. To do that, we're going to be looking at how we prove triangles to be congruent and from there we can actually discover what these other properties are. So stick around and find out how this all comes together. Let's get it on! Before we go ahead and take a look at quadrilateral proofs, let's take a look at properties of this figure here, ABCD, and if we told you it's a parallelogram, and it is, what we know immediately from the definition is, is that the opposite sides of the parallelogram must be parallel to each other. That's what a parallelogram is. Well, it also turns out that it also has properties about it that are also true. For instance, opposite sides are not only parallel, but they're also congruent. So if this side was 10 units long, that means the opposite side CD would be the exact same length. Same thing for top and bottom. Let's say this was 18 units long, the bottom would be as well. Also, another one is, if we take any particular angle, take angle A, and I told you it was 70 degrees, uh, and property is that opposite angles have the same measure. So this must be 70 degrees as well. And then here's another one. Two angles that are adjacent to each other or consecutive would, are always going to be supplementary. So that means angle C and D must add up to be 180 degrees. So 180 minus 70 is 110, so this would be 110 degrees. And either you could say these two are supplementary because they're consecutive, or you could say B and D are opposite, so they're congruent, so that'll be 110 degrees as well. So these are the, some of the properties that are true about a parallelogram that are not actually part of the definition. So now let's take a look at how we actually prove these things to be true. So I've gone ahead here and made a parallelogram, uh, just a little figure over here. It says in our, in our information that math is a parallelogram that's given to us. So in our first uh, statement here, we're gonna say math is a parallelogram and we know that because it was given to us. And then I went ahead and I marked up what we know about parallelograms. So we have these two sides are going to be parallel. That's M-A and T-H. We know that from the definition of a parallelogram. And same thing for the top and the bottom sides, A-T and M-H. Those sides are going to be parallel as well because that's the definition. So now is the part where we got to do a little bit of work in terms of proving things to be true. You'll notice there's a dotted line here in the middle, which makes this into two triangles. And that's kind of the key in all this, is to make two triangles. And we're gonna prove that they're actually congruent to each other. So I'm gonna take the low hanging fruit first, and that is this MT uh, line here is in both triangles. And so I'm gonna go ahead and put that mark there. So I can say MT is congruent to TM. And as you know earlier from all the work you were doing with congruent triangles, the reason for that is called the reflexive property. So already we've gone ahead now and we've been able to show that at least they have a side that's congruent here in, in terms of these two triangles. So I'm gonna write reflexive prop right here. Next up, uh, we need to do some other work here. Uh, let's look at some angles here. So if we take our, our sides here that are on the left and the right, and we take this line through, that's a transversal, and it turns out that this angle right here and this angle right over here would be considered alternate interior angles with the left and the right and the transversal cutting in between them. And because these lines are parallel, it proves that these alternate interior angles are congruent. So let's go ahead and write that out. So this would be angle AMT. So here we go, angle AMT and then we'd say is congruent to the other angle over here, and we could say HTM, so angle HTM. And the reason why we know that is if the lines are parallel, so I'm gonna say if lines parallel, then alternate interior angles are congruent. So that's how we know that to be true. 
And by the way, this is alternate interior angles. May not look very good, not my best handwriting ever, but you get the idea there. Also, we can take a look at if we're using the top and the bottom side with this transversal, I'm gonna just go ahead and switch colors here, the, the angle right here, and this angle here that I'm marking up with the two marks as well in green, these would also be considered alternate interior angles. And for the same reason that these two sides are parallel, we now know that angle A, T, M, so angle A, T, M, would be congruent to this other angle down here would be say T, M, H, angle T, M, H, and how we know that is the exact same rationale as above. So I'm just gonna put some ditto marks here. If lines parallel, alternate interior angles are congruent. All right, so at this moment in time, we have enough now to prove that our triangles are actually congruent. And what we know is, is we've got basically two angles in each of them, and it's the side in between them. So it's gonna be angle side angle is how we know this to be true. So I'm gonna write angle side angle congruence. And let's go ahead and name the top one. I'm gonna start at A, I'm gonna to go to M, and I'm gonna to go to T. So I'm gonna to go to triangle A, there's my A, I got my M, and I got my T. And that triangle would be congruent to triangle. So if I start at A and I go to the purple one here, I have to start at H and go to T and then M, so H, T, M. All right, so you'll notice at this point here, we got almost everything filled out on this statement reason to column proof. And then what we need to do last is, is what we need to prove. So how do we know that to be true? We have one statement and we have a second statement here. And, and here's the reasoning. We know that the triangle on the, on the top left here and the bottom right are now congruent. And once we know that, any side or angle so that, the, that are corresponding to each other that we've yet to talk about are going to be congruent as well. And that's because when we have congruent triangles, uh, their congruent parts are also congruent. So I can now say, I'm going to switch color yet again here. I'm going to go back to purple. I can say MA is congruent to TH. And by the way, you'll notice here, TH is the first two letters here and AM is the first two letters here, just backwards. So it also mixes up and, and jives with what we said in the line above it. And we know that because congruent triangles have what's called congruent parts. Once again, any angle or side we've yet to talk about, once we know the triangles are congruent, if they correspond to each other, they must also be congruent as well. And likewise over here, AT, which by the way is the first and the third letter in this one here, is gonna be congruent to the first and the third letter um, in the other one. So that'd be HM, which is right over here. And from here, we say the exact same thing. Congruent triangles have congruent parts. So really the secret in this is, is you start with what's given. Uh, you can use properties of whatever that figure is hopefully in there. And you're trying to prove that the triangles that make up that quadrilateral are congruent. And then from there, you can say that congruent triangles have congruent parts. And what you're trying to prove is always last. If you like what you've seen and heard so far, please like, comment, or subscribe. Thank you, and back to part two. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at one more proof here, and it's a little backwards. So I've already written in here, JR, line segment bisects angle URY, and also angle U is congruent to angle Y. So that's already written here in our, in our statements here. I've gone ahead and marked up angle U and angle Y. Uh, let's take a look first at this. What does it mean when JR bisects angle URY? Well, URY would be right over here. And if JR cuts it in half, it means if I take this angle here and that cuts it in half, it means that each little piece that makes up that are going to be congruent. So if angle R, for instance, was 100 degrees, each of these little mini angles here would be half of that or 50. So now I can say angle U R, J, so angle U, R, J, is congruent to angle, and I could say like Y, R, J. And the reason why I know that is this first line right over here 
gives us that information because we know what the definition of an angle bisector is. So I'm going to say definition of angle bisector. That's how we knew that to be true. All right, from here, what we need to now do is we need to see if we can come up with any other information. And lo and behold, they share a side. Isn't that good news there? So I'm going to go ahead and put a mark right there. So I can say JR line segment is congruent to RJ line segment, and that is the reflexive property. So this one is moving fairly quick here in terms of what we want to do. And once again, we're going from given information to trying to prove that two triangles are congruent. And hopefully from that, we can prove that this quadrilateral J-U-R-Y is a kite. So I'm seeing two angles. I'm seeing a side. You'll notice, though, the side's not between the two angles. So it's going to be angle, angle, side. And therefore, I can now say I'm going to start at J and go to U and go to R. So J, U, R, triangle J, U, R, should be congruent to triangle uh, J, Y, R. And there we have it. So now we've gotten almost all the way through. So last but not least. We have to think about what a kite is. So I'm actually going to write that as my last line because that's what we're trying to prove anyway. So I'm going to say jury is a kite. And we'll get the reason later here. But we have to think to ourselves, so what is a kite? Well, a kite would be we've got two pairs of consecutive sides that are congruent. So for instance, if I look at this here, JU and JY, which are these sides right here, even though we haven't talked about them yet, they must be congruent. So I'm gonna go ahead and put two marks on each of them here. Uh, so that would be part of the definition of a kite. So let's go ahead and write that over here. JU is congruent to JY. And how we know that is congruent triangles have congruent parts. And then the last part of this, and I'm going to go ahead and change color here to green, would be these two sides must be congruent to each other. And lo and behold, let's look back here. That is RY, that's our last two letters right here. And here's our other one here, UR, which is this one over here. So we can say UR is congruent to uh, YR. And that is shown up here in the diagram for the very same reason over here. So we have congruent triangles have congruent parts. And then to wrap this all up, the reason why we needed to prove that to be true to show that it's a kite is, well, we needed to know what a kite is and what was a kite. We figured that out. So the reason why this is true is it's called the definition of a kite. That was the, what we just proved in the last two statements before it. So we proved it right here in this statement, and we also proved it in the one right before too. And now we know that jury must be a kite due to the definition of what a kite is. So you guys, I know this is a lot here. Proofs is you know not everybody's favorite subject in, in math, but uh, you know it does build on what you hopefully have learned in the past about congruent triangles. And it's just a little bit more added on. So I hope you've gotten a lot out of this uh, video here, and I uh, hope to see you again in future videos. Thanks for watching.